You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that am. So I think what I'm going to do today, um, I'm going to do it right now. Once a week, what I wanted to do was to create a free article on the Substack so that people can kind of get an idea of what it is, take a look, take a peek, see if it's like, all right, this is kind of cool. I'll, uh, I'll take the plunge or not. Um, but the other reason I want to do it is I want to make the last article I wrote free is because I want to talk about it today. It's kind of interesting because everybody's talking about how yesterday's training camp was stupid. Um, I, I'm just pulling up an article right now from Bill Huber, player of the day, uh, Matt LaFleur says, yeah, granted he's not a player or whatever, but, um, kudos to him for shutting this down to the public because it was stupid. It was boring. It was a waste of time. And granted, it's probably not super exciting for people to show up and take their kids out there just to watch these half speed walkthroughs. But there wasn't a day so far in practice that, um, and granted, there's been some good stuff with Zach Tom and everything else, and, and it's been fun to see Romeo Dobbs perform well and everything. But in terms of um, structuring the roster and getting a clearer picture of where everybody's at, I have not had a better day than yesterday. And the biggest reason is because although you didn't get to see fun stuff, which it's hard to move guys up and down too much based on how well they play with you know no pads and all this kind of stuff, but the biggest thing is they talked a lot, and maybe it's just because the, the media covered it more, whereas before they didn't, I don't know, but they did a lot of special team stuff. So I saw a lot of notes on who was first team special teams, who was first team kick return, who was this, who was that. It was, so it really kind of restructured my view of the roster. So today is going to be a little bit of sort of a kind of like doing a 53-man roster, but I'm not cutting it off at 53. I'm just telling you where I have everybody ranked. With a couple other notes, tight end is the one really weird one, and I may change the structure of that because it's kind of convoluted, but it's also sort of important to understanding where I have people ranked because, again, I see them as very different positions. And I do that with wide receiver, for example. I have a separate slot category. For corner, I have a separate slot category because, again, it's important. Um, I don't want to just look at somebody as cornerback five or six if they are the number two slot corner because it just it doesn't give the right impression. They have a much better chance of making the roster than it would appear based on being, you know, uh, CB6. It's like, well, actually, they're CB2 behind, you know, Razul Douglas in the slot. So he's he's 100% going to make the roster, that kind of stuff. So I guess it's also kind of an explainer of, of where I'm at as opposed to just having it on the on the website. Also want to give a big shout out to uh, Bryce for jumping in on Patreon. Sorry, I missed that. It's just been so it's been so quiet over there. It's, every time I go look, somebody's deleting Patreon and I'm losing another one and I don't even want to go look at it. So <laughs> I decided to look at it. They got a new layout over there, which I thought would mean, hey, they maybe they have some cool new features for everybody. They At the beginning of the year, they're like, oh, we're going to try out like you can live stream right on there. You can host your own videos and upload them right on there. It's going to be great. They haven't done jack squat. So they finally got a new layout, and I got all excited about, oh, maybe they're going to have those cool features, and I can start doing video on there and everything, and there's nothing new. It's just a slightly different layout, so whatever. It's Supposedly, there's a, a, a better experience for you, especially in terms of if you want to join Patreon and all that kind of stuff with the payment and everything. I don't know. I I, I don't know. Could could try it. You should you should test it. Go, go uh, sign up on Patreon. Let me know how your experience was. Um, um, just just a thought patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you want to support the podcast um what else uh yeah bryce thank you sir uh first of all observations from other 
training camps and whatnot. Nothing really from the Lions, kind of the same old thing. The only thing that seems to be going on over there is their head coach is weird. His new thing now is um, coming up with weird nicknames for guys. Demetrius Taylor is now being called Sawed Off, as in like a sawed off shotgun. I don't even know who Demetrius Taylor is, but we have to apply this like false false bravado to everybody, I guess. I, I, I guess what's annoying is it's like, you're trying to make things seem awesome that just really aren't awesome. And, I, you know, I mean, I guess have fun or whatever. You know, it's your team. You're trying to make it fun and all that. But it's all going to come crashing down when you play week one and just get smashed into oblivion. And Sawed Off doesn't even get on the field. His favorite is Josh Reynolds, apparently. He says, quote, He's a slippery man. I call him the praying mantis. He's the spider of death. There's something about him. Frickin' serpent. Okay, whatever. You know what I mean? I, I just feel like sometimes there's certain teams that just focus on silliness because there's nothing else going on. I mean, you, you look at the Packers and sometimes you wish there was a little bit more, but it's just, it's so unbelievably professional in their approach to things and the way that they do things. You know, we're excited about the special teams coordinator because he's very serious and he's very intense and Matt LaFleur does not just hand out praise and, this, and all these guys, they're very... You know, they're 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 doing good, but they're not doing good enough. And we expect more. And it's about discipline and it's about being in the right place and doing the right thing and understanding your assignment. And it's about being a professional and showing da 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 da. And then again, like the that's the whole thing with Pat Mahomes practicing no look passes and behind the back passes. Like you're just being silly. That has nothing to do with with actually training to be a really good quarterback. And Dan Campbell is just kind of a goofball, and we all kind of get that. But at some point, it's like, we just got to focus on being good football players. Your team is a disaster, and you've got some serious issues to work through. And we're going to focus on, like, he's the spider of death. Like, dude, he's like your fourth or fifth wide receiver. He's probably even behind Quintez Cephas at this point. Can Can we just, like, be serious and focus on getting wins for your fan base a little bit? I don't know. I just, just, like, when this is what fans have to get excited about is like Dan Campbell is like this hardcore juiced up personality as well as you know chemicals I'm just saying I mean you know his DNA I'm sure is is fantastic but that dude is he's got muscles on his muscles but it's just it just seems it's to the point of being kind of stupid and again if you if you look at the top teams is Andy Reid act like this no his quarterback's kind of getting weird but Andy Reid does not does Bill Belichick act like this no does Matt LaFleur act like this no Does Kyle Shanahan act like this? No, he does not. So win a few games, and then you can start calling people the spider of death. And maybe if you want to start with nicknames, pick some players that are actually going to contribute to your team. You know, accomplish something first. You know, Sean McVay's a little on, like, the fun side and everything, but when it comes down to it, man, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just kind of stupid. Like, every time I go look at the Lions, it's like, what are you guys doing, man? Like, I get that you're having fun, that's great, but are you going to win football games or what? Even like the Bears and the Vikings, they're, they're at least like trying, you know? I mean, you go look at the Bears camp and you got the new offensive coordinator screaming and swearing at their guys for not being good enough. Campbell, like, how's it going? And it, he's, every, he's just heaping, pr- like, if you listen to Dan Campbell, they are a Super Bowl caliber team. This is the best team. You ask him about like who the good players are and he's like, well, we'd have to do a list of like who's not a really good player because there's just so many. And he's looking at fourth and fifth and sixth string guys like, oh, he's the serpent of death. What are you, what are we talking about, Dan? What are we doing here, Danny? He, he just, he needs to cool it with the caffeine, I think. It's, it's endearing to a point, And now it's just getting to the point of being kind of ridiculous. Like you, your team sucked last year and maybe your focus should be on that's not good enough. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. And if you want a freaking nickname, let's go win some games and then we can work on nicknames. But this team right now sucks. And I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to tolerate that. And I'm not talking about four or five wins. We need to go to the playoffs. That's what we're here for. That's the expectation in Detroit now. And I think maybe that's my biggest issue is it's like he's excited for what they have and what they have is not good enough. So, I mean, you can't have it both ways. This is either good enough or it's not good enough. And if you're going to sit there and talk about how great everybody is and all these guys are just, you know, the, the serpent and the, the spider and the, every other kind of animal, then I guess you're good enough. This is what you want. This is it. Great. It's awesome, Dan. Well done. 
But anyways, and, and again, that's it. That's that's the note. Is he's like handing out goofy nicknames to his players. That's it. That's all I got from Lions Camp. Everything is heaping praise. Dan Camp or no, uh, that's the coach. Whatever. This other no name guy I've never heard of. He's so good on special teams. Like, oh, all right, great. Well, I look forward to watching you win fifteen games this year. Uh, as for the Vikings, not a ton. J- um, Jared Allen got added to the Ring of Honor, which is cool. Guy was a monster. Obviously not for the Bears, despite the Bears bragging that they got this complete stud and everything, and he went there, and it was just cop- obviously over the hill. Bears obviously just have never learned their lesson. They love to buy the NFC North scraps, and then they fail. Makes me laugh, though. Got a big right guard battle going on. That was their big weakness. I'm sure they'll figure out something that's at least better than it was last year. Yeah, like four guys, uh, including yesterday Ed Ingram, their rookie for the first time, getting some snaps there. Here's the biggest takeaway, though. There's, I woke up this morning and there's a whole lot of talk about quarterbacks and quarterback criticism and all that stuff. I, I just want the Vikings to put up or shut up. I'm dead serious. Either respect the quarterback that you have or get rid of them. Because here, here's the problem. They want to have it both ways. The only reason they win any games is because they have Kirk Cousins at quarterback, but yet they still want to criticize him and act as though he's the one holding the team back. I just watched a Minnesota Vikings podcast asking if if Kirk Cousins can be the guy, and a couple people were saying, well, maybe Zimmer's holding him back or whatever. One of the guys wanted to blame the record on Kirk Cousins and say, you know, you can't be, you know an 8-9 and nine quarterback, as though the record is directly tied to the quarterback, as though maybe it could be somebody else's fault. And then the, the fourth guy says he wishes he could be a Jimmy Garoppolo, or a, and he just listed a bunch of kind of subpar quarterback, implying that Kirk Cousins is worse than all of the... the <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to think Vikings fans are worse than Bears fans when it comes to just making up these completely ridiculous narratives. See, Bears fans were, were saying... Justin Fields is an elite quarterback, and it's the head coach and the offensive coordinator and these guys, they're holding him back, and if we can just cut ties and get somebody else, we'll be better. Vikings fans are doing the exact same thing, but from a different standpoint. They look at it and say, we are a Super Bowl caliber team, but the quarterback is holding us back. Literally, one of the best players on your team. I think Justin Jefferson is maybe the only better player than Kirk Cousins on that team. But he constantly gets blamed, constantly. He's better than Dalvin. He's better than Thielen. He's better than every single one of those those mediocre offensive linemen. He's better than the mediocre at best tight ends that you have on your team. I think he's better than Daniil Hunter, which is hard to, you know, gauge or whatever. But, you know, Daniil had a great year once, like Zadarius did. But, you know, is he a top 10 pass rusher? Eh. Is Cousins a top 10 quarterback? Yes, he is. He's certainly better than your garbage linebackers and your your subpar defensive tackles and your garbage corners. And he's even better than your one good safety. Kirk Cousins is not your problem. He's not. And I don't get it. But again, here's the thing. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. You know, the GMs trash him. The coaches trash him. The fans, get rid of him. He can go win games somewhere else. Kellen Mond got got slotted in with with the twos, and they wanted to. And Vikings fans were all excited, like, "Yeah, Kellen Mond is getting opportunities finally." They were all mad at Zimmer because Zimmer wasn't giving him opportunities. You know why? Because the guy is horrible. But just give the keys to Kellen Mond and let let's run it, or go out and get somebody else. Pick up Garoppolo. You're saying he's not as good as Garoppolo. Get Garoppolo. That was one of the. You know, at least Garoppolo got him to a Super Bowl. Oh my goodness. So Garoppolo dragged the 49ers, dragged Kyle Shanahan, dragged Bosa, dragged Debo and all these other players through their wins. Kittle, Buckner, or whoever else was on the team at the time, dragged them. One of, one of the premier offensive lines at the time, one of the best rushing attacks in the NFL, premier defensive line. They had Sherman, who had a, a bounce back year with the 49ers. I think he was maybe CB1 in the NFL the, the year that they were, I think, went to the Super Bowl or something. I don't know. But Gar- Garoppolo dragged them, and yet Kirk Cousins is holding back the Minnesota Vikings. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Stop making excuses. Y- you don't get to hang on to them and cling to them and then also blame them. Get rid of them. 2021 quarterbacks by PFF passing grade. Ready? Joe Burrow, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins. There you go. There's the top four. Joe Burrow, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins. 
I cannot believe on a Packers podcast I'm sitting here bragging and defending a Vikings quarterback, but you guys are so stupid about this. It's unbelievable. He was fourth in pat tied with Russell Wilson in passer rating, 103.1. Aaron Rodgers, Joe Burrow, Matt Stafford, and then Wilson and Cousins with 103.1, tied for fourth best passer rating. What do you want other than a scapegoat? What do you want? I mean, at least the Bears fans can point to something that actually sucked and say, they suck, we'll get rid of them, we'll be better. I don't think it's that easy because it doesn't explain away the offensive line or the fact that Justin Fields did kind of suck or the lack of wide receivers or defensive tackles or pass rushers or linebackers or cornerbacks or safeties. It doesn't really fix all those problems, but at least you're pointing to something that sucked and saying that by bringing in someone better, it'll elevate everybody else. It'll elevate the level of play. So at least we're getting the best out of the guys we have, even if that's not good enough. All right, fine. I can get behind that. What the heck are you guys? You're picking one of the best players on your team, one of the few actually really good players on your team, and every single year bashing him, saying he's the problem, he's the problem. Then get rid of him. Get rid of him. Believe me, I want him out. I've seen him play against the Packers. I've seen those pinpoint passes. One of the few times Jair seems to get cut up is is against Kirk Cousins, and they're just these ridiculously accurate passes where you look at it and go, there's nothing he could have done about that. I vividly remember that happening a handful of times, and every single time it's Kirk Cousins throwing that perfect, only could be in that one spot pass. He did it to Diggs. He did it with with, uh, Jefferson. He's done it with Thielen. It's not, well, it's, it's because of uh, Jefferson. He's the best wide receiver. No, I've seen it with three different wide receivers. All of them are good wide receivers, but you know what the common thread is? It's not the wide receiver, it's the quarterback. And even the whole, well, he doesn't do good at prime time, that narrative is dead. It's been dead for a couple of years, so you can't even say that anymore. It's not true. His grades over the last three years, 88, 83, 84, and even in 2018, his first year with Minnesota was a 79.3, basically an 80. So 80, 84, 83, and 88. He's been a very good quarterback. And if you're saying that we need somebody better than that, then you're really just saying we need Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady, and then we'll win. But nothing worse. Okay, well, best of luck waiting on that to happen. But the idea that he's some bottom 10 quarterback, and if we could... It's the same thing with the 49ers. Like, all of a sudden, Garoppolo is just this complete hack, this complete garbage quarterback that's been dead weight. And if we just get somebody that's halfway adequate, then we'll win Super Bowls. I mean, at least there's somewhat of an argument there, but he is the definition of adequate. He is, you know, a a quote-unquote good quarterback, 77, 67, 71. He's in that 70 range. He's good. He's not great. This is is kind of what, and both teams are wrong. Jimmy Garoppolo is decent. The idea that he's garbage, and if we just had a decent quarterback, we'd be better. No, Jimmy is the decent quarterback that can get you there. You don't just need a decent quarterback. You need a really good quarterback. Here, I have an idea. Why don't you get Kirk Cousins? Maybe you should just swap quarterbacks. Jimmy's looking for a team. I'm sure most Vikings fans won't like that, but you got some smart mouth Vikings fans who are saying, oh, he wishes he could be Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay, great. Try him out then. That is a massive downgrade. Because again, Cousins is a top five quarterback and he gets better every year. He's ascending. He's not getting worse, but instead of giving him like an actual long-term contract, you know, like a three-year contract or something like that, you give him these one-year fully guaranteed contracts, which is so stupid. But the only reason you keep doing it is because you feel stuck to a quarterback that you don't want. The whole thing is so insane to me. I just want you to get rid of him. I don't want him in this division. He's a good quarterback and I want him gone. Matt Stafford left and he won a Super Bowl in his first year. Go ahead and let him go. Let him go. Watch him go to the 49ers and win a Super Bowl. You bunch of absolute idiots. Ungrateful. (laughs) Just whatever. I'm just just so tired of it. I'm tired. Then do something about it. Get rid of them. But I got to watch this guy scare the living daylights out of me every single time we play the Vikings. He doesn't really throw interceptions. 33 touchdowns, 7 picks. Doesn't really do it. Very accurate with the football. Very precise. And I just, I just want him out of here. And you just, you're, you're not going to do it. I, you're you're going to make me suffer through Kirk Cousins, and then I got to listen to you talk about how he's the one holding you back. Just, good Lord. Draft somebody and cut bait. Do what the 49ers did. Draft someone and then just be like, all right, bye, see ya. And, and best of luck. Because the odds that you're going to get another top five quarterback in the draft, very low. 
I don't care if you pick him number one, two, three, four, five overall, which isn't going to happen because Kirk Cousins is your quarterback and he's not going to let you be that bad. He's the thing holding you up from a top five pick. It's just annoying. I don't know. Anyways, Chicago Bears news. Um, Center Lucas Patrick has a broken thumb and is going to undergo surgery. I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but the one note I see is he may not be ready week one, so it doesn't sound like it's a long-term deal. Something I'm guessing you can probably, you know, put a cast on his hand or something at some point, and he'll he'll be able to play. But there there have been somebody posted it, and I didn't. I don't think I saved it. Maybe I did. Let me check. I did. the The Packers Andy Herman posted it. The Packers injury bug he says goes too far, and it's affecting former players. Kyler Fackrell apparently is on IR. Micah Hyde, I believe, yesterday was carted off the field. Hopefully, he's going to be okay. That's a major blow, by the way, to the Buffalo Bills if he's if he's out for any time. Lucas Patrick, as I mentioned, broke his thumb in the Bears practice. And Taysom Hill apparently got uh, injured and is out. So, kind of crazy the amount of injuries there have been, especially to current and for Even Rodgers was talking about it. It's unusual to have this many injured players before camp has even started. And, um, again, you got former players even. Um, there was some really good but also really bad news at the same time. Um, news for the Chicago Bears. Both rookies had picks yesterday. Jaquan Brisker, the safety, had an interception, as well as rookie Kyler Gordon had a pick. The bad news is the quarterback in both cases was Justin Fields. So <laughs> it's one of those like, yeah, go rookies. And on the other hand, oh crap, our quarterback maybe isn't great. And obviously, if you had to pick which one's more important, Justin Fields not throwing picks would be great. Now, it's not always his fault, but I, I did see specific notes about it was off the player's hands and was kind of overthrown, and that's how it ended up being picked. The other great thing, at least from my biased perspective, is that it's one thing to have a pick based on just really having a fun, found, fundamental, foundational understanding of the defense, making a great read, a great break, and all that stuff. It's another thing to just be standing out there and see a ball get tipped into your hands because your quarterback overthrew the receiver who couldn't hang on, which is a constant theme with these receivers, cannot hang on to anything at all. And the ball flies up in the air and you are able to get there and catch it. That's, you know, I mean, it's, it's great, but it's, there's, a different, there's a difference between you got to pick because you're really good and you got to pick because a ball kind of fell into your lap, you know? Now, I don't know. I think that was the case with, um, I think Brisker might have been a little bit more of a intelligence pick. I don't think that one was tipped. I think he jumped in front of Cole Komet. But again, either way, I don't care because I will happily hand the rookies a couple picks if it means Justin Fields is out there throwing picks left and right. It just, it makes me happy. Because again, everything hinges on Fields. Everything. Based on a couple things that I've seen on this roster, if they break correctly and, and Justin Fields is a good quarterback, this could be a pretty decent team. Potentially. They, they've got issues. But I think the offensive line has potential. Justin Fields, we're saying again, takes a step. Montgomery's okay. Mooney's pretty good. The corners, maybe. Safe D, maybe. You know, you could you could squeeze out some wins with this roster, assuming Fields. But if Fields is not it, then they're just going to be complete garbage. So keep the Justin Fields pick news coming. Hilariously to me. You know how the Packers talk about iron sharpens iron? I, I don't mean to pick on Zach. I like Zach a lot. He's a, a Bears reporter. I've, I've done a lot of work with him in the past. But, <laughs> and, and he's just quoting him, but it's, it's just hilarious. The, the Packers talk a lot about iron sharpens iron. And when we talk about iron sharpens iron, you're talking about what? Really good players like Jair going up against somebody that's going to be sharpened. You know, it's a really good player helping out another player. When Valus Jones was asked about it, about going up against Kyler Gordon, two rookies, he said, iron sharpens iron. (laughs) I'm sorry, man. I mean, sure, but it's more like rubber kind of just rubs up against rubber at this point. You know, I'm I'm not sure we're, we're at the iron stage. Uh, Tevin Jenkins, I mentioned, was out. Sounds like there's an injury. I guess Matt Everflus, the uh, coach, does not want to talk about injuries, so it's hard to get any real information. But Tevin, who has struggled to get a starting job, is is now apparently injured. So anyways, that's about all I got as far as like major updates and whatnot. Um, on the Packers front, they actually brought in another offensive tackle by the name of Jared Williams. They're working out. They didn't sign him to my knowledge, but they did bring him in. Uh, 2022 undrafted free agent initially picked up by the Philadelphia Eagles, who obviously had let him go. Played for the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, actually was in college for quite a long time. Spent four years at Houston and then two years at Miami. Kind of had a breakout year in 2021, so it's we're talking year six in college. 
But uh, 84 overall grade, 84 run blocking, 80 pass blocking grade, allowed three sacks, seven hurries, 10 total pressures on the season, and has primarily been a right tackle, almost exclusively. At, at Houston for a while, he was kind of a left tackle a little bit, has done nothing on the interior, but 236 snaps at tackle, uh, excuse me, at left tackle, zero in the last three years, 2,615 snaps at right tackle. So he's going to be a little bit older, obviously. I don't know his age, but he's been in college for that long. He's going to have some age there. Um, Always graded out as a good pass blocker. Really, it's just the run blocking that was kind of suspect and obviously got better this this past year. So um, don't know if anything will come of it, but that's that's the news. That's the update. Anyways, why don't we take a break here? We'll come back. And as I said, I I want to go through the entire roster. Um, I did just make the whole thing free. I did it just now, so I didn't forget. Um, so if you want to see it kind of in writing, and again, I'm doing this every day. I'm, it's the same list. I'm just updating it, moving people up and down on different tiers or whatever, uh, based on the new information we get from training camp. So there should be another one today because I'm pretty sure there's another training camp. Um, and usually somebody gets moved around once or twice so I, that may get skipped once in a while if, you know, there's no real news to move anybody, but, um, we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm mostly excited about the wide receiver situation with Sammy Watkins and what they decide to do with him and Dobbs. That That's going to be kind of a big deal. I have a feeling they're going to be on separate tiers at the end of today, but I don't really know who goes where. But anyways, uh, we'll take a quick break. Again, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you want to support the podcast. If you want to go over to the Substack, it's packernet.substack.com. Um, Again, a lot going on over there. I, I, I'm struggling to get through my Minnesota Vikings overview because there's so much Packers stuff going on, and I got two podcasts a day and everything else. But I will get that done, and then a Lions overview. Uh, at some point, I'll be putting together an official 53, but I, I got to keep working through kind of what I'm doing here, which is just here's the 90 and where they're all sorted and kind of keep going through the notes and everything. So I'm, I'm going to keep cranking these kinds of things. I think another thing I want to do with the Substack, another article, especially on maybe a slower day or a day where they don't have a training camp, is um, put a, because I've been saving all the notes from all the different players from each day of training camp. So maybe have each player and all their highlights and lowlights and type type those types of things. And maybe just throw in a, a little rating score or something for training camp so far. Something like that. I don't know. But anyways, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Survivor 46 is here, and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. All right. So um, going through the roster and again, the way I have it set up in this article is based on tiers. You know, it's sort of sort of like the first team, second team, but it's not really right. So, for example, you can be. The, fir- the first team wide receivers are Alan Lazard, you know, I don't know, let's say Sammy Watkins and then Randall Cobb. But 
Alan Lazard is on his own tier because I think he is wide receiver one. Randall Cobb, I put in as, as slot tier number one because he is the number one slot guy. So it's, it's, it's different and it kind of sets it up in a way that I think is just a little bit more easy to understand without like definitive rules and, and things that don't really give as clear of a picture. So quarterback is the easiest of all. There's three tiers. Aaron Rodgers is one. Jordan Love is two. Danny Etling is three. I don't expect to ever have to touch that throughout this process. Jordan Love will not fall below Danny Etling. He will not go above Aaron Rodgers. It's just not going to happen. Uh, wide receiver, as I said, Alan Lazard, I do have on a separate, I think he's wide receiver one. I don't think that's going to change. I really don't. I, I think they've crowned him that X receiver, that number one receiver. They've given him Devontae's job and they expect him to be that guy. Now that doesn't mean he's going to end the season with the most yards or the most touchdowns or anything like that necessarily, but he is that guy right now. And so the, the question is, who is tier two? And right now I have Sammy Watkins, Christian Watson, and Romeo Dobbs. And I put all the guys that are out on injury still on here because it's still a picture of where do I see them being ranked um, when they're healthy, when they're on the field. And that is kind of where I see that right now. Now, Winfrey has been getting a lot of of, um, reps, a lot of love and all that stuff. But I don't think at the end of the day, he's ever going to be wide receiver two. I think right now it is a three-way competition between these guys. Dobbs was actually added, not yesterday, but the day before because of how good he's been. I had him on tier three with Winfrey and Taylor. Taylor, by the way, has been out, but I still think those two are kind of on a similar tier once he gets back. But tier two, I think, is it's going to be that competition. Now, again, it's going to be interesting today to see what happens. Are they going to put Alan Lazard and Sammy out there and Dobbs goes back? If In which case, I think Romeo Dobbs goes either back down to tier three or he gets his own tier on tier three, and then I just bump Winfrey and Taylor down. I'm not entirely sure. If it's kind of 50-50 between the two, then I got it right. If Dobbs is the guy and Sammy's not, which I would be surprised by, then I guess Dobbs is is kind of tier tier two, and I would probably put Sammy and, and Christian behind that. So that, that'll be something to keep an eye on. Again, tier three, I have Winfrey and Taylor. Um, I do think Juwan Winfrey is above guys like Danny Davis and Samori Ture, but I can't put him on the list of, of legitimately being that guy this season, like I can with Sammy, Christian, and Romeo. And again, I think Malik Taylor, they, I know they like Winfrey. I know they like Taylor. When Taylor comes back, maybe we'll be able to separate out the two and see which one's ahead of, of which. And I may just put Winfrey ahead of Taylor just because he's having such a good camp right now and the fact that he's available, which matters and everything. So maybe Winfrey will be three, Taylor will be four, and then it'll just be down from there. Just just to put Winfrey just a, a half a peg ahead of him. So um, then after that, I have tier four, which is uh, Toure and Davis. And I'm putting them on, putting them on the same tier you could say Samore is a slight bit ahead, but I don't think he has been. I think Davis has been the Wisconsin Badgers wide receiver. I think he's been more impressive in camp. He's also been a special teamer, and Samore Ture has not. So for whatever benefit Ture gets for being a seventh-round pick that Davis doesn't, I think Davis has done enough to prove that he's been as good, if not better, in camp, and he's been more valuable on special teams than Samore Ture has. So I'm going to put them on the same tier, and that's sort of the the Packers like them, but they're not going to be on the roster. They they are basically um, like premier practice squad guys. Um, after that, I have I had Ishmael Hyman and Osiris Mitchell on the same tier. However, as I said, one of the big things that happened yesterday was special teams, and that kind of gave some clarity. So instead of Hyman and Mitchell being on the same tier, Hyman was used as a kick returner. I'm sure he's way down the list, but still. The fact that they're wanting to see what he can do on special teams gives him a little bit more of a bump. So I'm not going to move Hyman up to the Toure Davis tier because he's not there. And I don't think he really has a very good shot, but it's still better than Osiris Mitchell, who is not getting on the field. He's not getting opportunities. He's not being put on special teams. So it's not about even moving Ishmael up. It's about moving Osiris down. I've not heard his name. I've not seen him do anything. I've not, nothing. So the tier is... Tier 1, Lazard. Tier 2, Watkins, Watson, and Dobbs. Tier 3 is Winfrey and Taylor. Tier 4 is Toure and Davis. Tier 5 is Ishmael Hyman. Tier 6 is Osiris Mitchell. Then you got your slot tiers, which is Randall Cobb and Amari Rogers. And I don't really see that changing. I, I was kind of interesting because um, I forget I forget the guy's name now. Uh, Eli, I think, Berkowitz. I didn't realize he was at camp. He's usually just posting highlights or whatever. I didn't really think about it, but I saw he had some uh, camp notes. And I try to put everybody that's at camp and and leaving these notes on there into, um, my list so I can see what everybody's doing. He was going on a kind of a tirade about Amari Rogers. He had a, I I saw a note from him saying something like, 
this is the second day Amari, you know, he's having a really good camp. He went off again today. And I'm like, I literally have not seen a single note about Amari. So up until I think two days ago when I saw that note and I did officially add him and I went back and found the Amari notes and added them. So I, you know, retroactively. So I haven't talked about it. I haven't put him on anything yet, but it, it was just interesting because from his perspective, he's been watching Amari and he's been impressed, impressed by Amari. And that's why I like having multiple people because there's a lot of stuff going on at once. And sometimes people don't feel the need to mention it. Sometimes people do. So apparently Amari has been having a fairly good camp, has had a couple good plays, and it just hasn't really been noticed by anybody except except Eli at this time. So something to keep an eye on, on top of the fact that Randall hasn't done much. You know, so whereas I thought it was a massive gap between Randall is, you know, obviously Rogers really likes and trusts Randall and all that stuff, but the talent gap, um, you know, if, if Randall is slowly declining as, as time goes on and Amari really does take a jump, I have a hard time believing they're going to remove Roger's best friend from the roster or whatever, but you know he they may be closing the gap a little bit. It's just something to keep an eye on. I guess I don't ever expect uh, you know this year Amari to supersede Randall, but maybe we can kind of close the gap because at this point you could almost say slot tier one is Randall Cobb, slot tier two is empty, slot tier three is Rogers. <laughs> um, tight end, and again, it's it's really. I like it, but I don't like it. I I keep going back and forth on how I want to do this. I have tight end split into three different categories, receiving tight end, blocking tight end, and H-back tight end. And the only reason I'm doing that is because I think if I were to look at it, based on what we've seen in camp and the way that that this is going on, the tight ends, if we just did a a regular ranking, would be Tyler Davis, then Mercedes Lewis, then Josiah DeGuara, then, you know, Dominique Daphne, then Alex. And it it just doesn't give a, a great picture because you'd be looking at it going, dang, Tyler Davis is tight end one. I don't think he is tight end one. I would say he's probably tight end four. However, he's taking Robert Tunyon's place as the number one receiving tight end while Tunyon is away. And because receiving is kind of what they're doing right now more than anything, and it's what you're going to get the most notes on, it makes him seem higher than what he is. In fact, I think Tyler Davis has been kind of bad. He he has not been as advertised. There was a the one big play, quote unquote, of the day yesterday was a pick by Razul Douglas. It was off the hands of Tyler Davis. And everyone's like, well, it's not that big of a deal. I think it is. Uh, it, it feels to me as though Tyler, the notes about Tyler Davis have not been great. He has not been as advertised. And as much as you don't want to overreact to it, I think the fact that we overreacted to him being the next great coming of, of whoever, that was also an overreaction. So I'm, I'm fine to just remove the, the Tyler Davis overreaction and say, until you show something, I'm just not buying it. And I don't think he has shown anything. So... Um, if we were to do an actual just one, two, three, four, five ranking, it would probably be Tunyon, then I guess Lewis, then DeGuara, then Daphne, then Tyler Davis, then Alizé Mack, and then Sal Canella. But I, I also don't want to do it that way because it doesn't give a, a great picture of who stays and who goes. Because again, Tyler Davis might be tight end five, but he's the number two receiving tight end, and that matters. So the way I have it broken down as far as receiving tight ends, Robert Tunyon is the number one then Tyler Davis, then I have Josiah DeGuara, then Sal Canella. Now, Sal Canella is more of a pure receiving tight end, but in terms of, he may be a better receiving tight end, quote-unquote, than Josiah DeGuara, but in terms of, let's just say, Robert Tunyon goes down, then Tyler Davis goes down, who's going to be in that role? Are they going to put Sal there, or are they going to put Josiah? I think they would do Josiah just because Josiah is Josiah. They like Josiah. They trust Josiah. They put So I, I put him ahead of Sal, but those are my four receiving tight ends, right? I mean, Mercedes Lewis can catch passes, but that's not, he's not going to be that guy that's in the slot 50% of the time. They're just not going to do that. They will find somebody else. Blocking tight end, Mercedes is obviously number one. I put Dominique number two. Then Alizé Mack, uh, who is a, just a, a, a blocking guy. And then I put Josiah DeGuara because that he's kind of a 50-50 blocking, receiving type of guy. So I put him next on that list. And then H back. I have Josiah DeGuara, then Mercedes Lewis, then Dominique Daphne, then Alizé Mack. And really, the only reason I have that ranking that way is because that's what I talked to Coach Hahn about this, and he kind of gave his insights, and that's how he laid it out. Kind of. I mean, I, I didn't phrase it as H-back, but um, when he went through the, the personnel, this sort of grouping, which is called Jeep, I believe, he had Mercedes there. I, I personally think Dominique is probably that guy in terms of being, because he gets used in that way, and Mercedes does not. So it, it, it kind of doesn't matter. The, the, the point is, though, when you look at it, Tyler Davis is the one that kind of sticks out on the, the, the... Everybody else doesn't matter. But Tyler Davis being the number two receiving tight end, I think, matters because 
I do think he's probably tight end five or tight end six, but the fact that he's tight end two in terms of, of receiving tight end gives him gives us a better perspective on why he may be staying on the team despite not really being whatever. It also, again, gives perspective on why he's being launched into that quote-unquote number one tight end role, which again, I don't think he is. I think he's the number he's the number two receiving tight end, and Tunyon is out, and so that puts him as the number one there. The number one blocking guy is still Mercedes. The number one H-back guy is still Josiah. So you've got three different number one tight ends out there on the field right now. And Tyler's going to get the most attention because he's the one that's catching most of the passes because he's the receiving tight end, right? So I don't want to undervalue Tyler Davis by saying he's tight end six, but I don't want to overvalue Tyler Davis by saying he's like tight end one or anything. So that's why I'm keeping the, the tight end tiers broken up this way. I don't think Alizé Mack or Sal Canella really are, are going to do anything. I, I don't know if Tyler Davis will either. Um, who knows? I, it's, it's a weird situation because there's so many tight ends. I know the Packers are going to keep Tunyon, Lewis, and DeGuara, and I know they really, really like Daphne. It's just a question of are they really going to have five tight ends because they want Tyler Davis. Could Tyler Davis be the guy until Tunyon comes back and then they then they dump him or put him on practice squad or whatever? I don't know. The way they've talked about him, he's the next coming of whatever, but it hasn't really been as advertised as I said. So weird situation, but that's kind of how I have the tight end thing broken down. It's my least favorite breakdown because it just I can't make it the way it makes the most sense. Um, offensive line, looking at left tackle, I think it's pretty straightforward. A lot of these, it's weird because it feels like this would be a really difficult thing to do, but I kind of like all my rankings here. Um, left tackle in particular seems very straightforward. David Bakhtiari, obviously number one. Elton Jenkins is number two. Yash Nijman is number three. And Zach Tom is number four. I don't see any real reason to believe it would be anything other than that. I think David Bakhtiari is the guy. I think if it came down to it, Elton Jenkins would take that spot. And then you'd put Yash or whoever at right tackle. Um, we've seen that Yash is number three. The the only potential thing could be if Zach Tom steals the job, but it's too early to crown Zach Tom over Yash Nijman. It may happen, but as of today, it has not happened. Uh, left guard, John Runyon is the guy, obviously. And then I've just got a bunch of competitions, and, and there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for anyone to really win that job. But I've got Hanson, Manette, Zach Tom, and Sean Ryan as tier two, and then Schneider and Clary, who are way down the depth chart, kind of centers slash interior guys as, you know, sort of that tier three. So it's it's basically a wide open four-way competition. Um, and there again, there just has not been a ton of clarity on who would be the next up left guard after John Runyon. I know Hanson has been sort of the right guard. I just had a cramp in my leg. <laughs> that scared me so bad. Cramps are the worst but it was also my hamstring. And that's such a massive muscle. I'm not bragging. I just mean generally that it's like, if this thing locks up, I'm going to be in, in a world of hurt. So I jumped out of my chair, smashed my toe. <laughs> Apparently I'm not drinking enough water or something. I don't know what the problem is, but we're good. We're back. What the heck was I talking about? Right guard? Oh, oh, uh, yeah. So, so Hanson has been sort of the right guard. We've seen Sean Ryan there. Zach Tom is more theoretical. I mean, presumably he could be like a uh, left guard, but I haven't really seen it yet. I think Manette was played um, uh, first or second string left guard. I forgot exactly. But so so all these guys are kind of on that tier, and I'm just kind of waiting to sort that out. Uh, and again, Schneider and Clary are not quite there. Center tiers, um, very straightforward. Josh Myers, number one. Jake Hansen, number two. Uh, Michael Manette and John Runyon I have on tier three, which is interesting because John Runyon was sort of a new addition. And he hasn't, I don't know if he's actually even done it yet. But the coach was talking about they would try him there. It might seem weird to put him on tier three with a guy like Manette, uh, who is a center or whatever, but just the fact that they really like John Runyon um, and the fact that they're going to kind of try that out as a fail-safe just in case, um, I would I would put John Runyon ahead of Zach Tom, Schneider, and Clary. And I put Zach Tom on tier four because he was partially a center in college. Haven't heard anything about it, haven't seen anything about it, but just I know he, that he can do it and is an option. And then again, Schneider and Clary are sort of the back of the roster, but they are centers, so potentially. Um, right guard tier is the only one that had an actual shakeup over this past um, this past Saturday. There was one change. So Royce Newman is right guard number one right now. Jake Hansen is number two. He's been consistently filling in when Royce is not in that spot. That is our backup center, by the way. Um, tier three, I have Sean Ryan and Cole Van Lannan. And Sean Ryan is there because he had some opportunities there. I think that's a good fit for him. Um, 
And Cole Van Lannen was was brought in, and I wasn't sure exactly where to put him. It was his first time kind of getting some reps there. They moved him from right tackle to right guard. And so it was somewhere in this range between Tier 4 and Tier 3. And Tier 4, I have Zach Tom by himself. And the reason, again, is because Zach Tom was drafted. They really liked the guy. But he's never actually played there. They haven't tried him at right guard. They've never done it. Cole Van Lannen has had opportunities there. So I put him with Sean Ryan because although, and maybe I could put Cole Van Lannen on his own tier between Sean Ryan and Zach Tom because it's maybe less likely that he wins it over Sean Ryan. But still, both Sean Ryan and Cole Van Lannen have had at least one opportunity to be the guy at right guard. So I'm putting them on the same tier. And then again, tier four is Zach Tom by himself because I'm putting him above guys like Manette, Moore, Schneider, and Clary because I just think he's a better player that they like more and and has a, a better opportunity to actually win that job if it comes to it. But because he hasn't been out there, because they've never put him there like they have with Cole Van Landon and Sean Ryan, I put him below. So he's got his own tier on tier four, and then tier five is Manette, Moore, Schneider, Clary. And then right tackle, Elton Jenkins is obviously RT1. After that would be Yash. I don't see any opportunity. I don't, I, David Bakhtiari would never be put over there. So it's basically just left tackle, but kind of further down the, the line. Uh, Royce Newman is number three because they've, we've seen him do that. Maybe Royce should be put on... Um, the left tackle tier somewhere, you know, you could maybe share it with Zach Tom. I don't know if they'd kick him over there or not, but uh, something to consider. Then it's Cole Van Lannen, who honestly might be, he, maybe he should share a tier with Royce. I know Royce has been kind of like the go-to, but if he ends up staying inside, then Cole is kind of higher than Royce or same tier or whatever. But for now, I've got it, Royce, then Cole. And then I put Zach Tom just because he's been getting tackle reps. They seem to like him at tackle. I wouldn't be surprised if they try him at right tackle just to see how it goes. Um, But since that seems to be what the Packers want to do, I put him as uh, tier five right tackle, Zach Tom. So Jenkins, Nijman, Newman, Van Lannon, Tom. Running backs, I've got uh, tier one is Jones and Dylan. Tier two, I put the rest partially because I was just being lazy at the time, but really it is just one big competition that I have not been able to separate out between Kylan Hill, who is not, who I think is on a tier by himself, but has been out, has been injured. He's on pop, and I don't know the extent of the injury. I don't know when he's coming back, and it is going to factor in, so that moves him down a little bit. Patrick Taylor, I think, is slightly behind Kylan, slightly ahead of B.J. Baylor and Tyler Goodson. Um, But the fact that, again, he ended the season really well, the fact that he's been healthy puts him maybe on the same tier as Kylan. However, he hasn't had as as good a camp as Goodson or Baylor. Um, and so I've, I've kind of just got them all in one big pile waiting for anything to kind of separate them out. I mean, Tyler Goodson had the one fumble of practice. Goodson, uh, Ty, did I say Pat, Patrick Taylor had the one fumble of practice. Goodson and Baylor, it's all been positive. I was kind of hoping that somebody would have been on special teams, but I didn't see any of these guys being put on special teams, so I couldn't separate them out. Kylan, by the way, was a kick returner. And again, I would love to put him ahead of these guys. And maybe that was a big reason why he was ahead of Patrick Taylor and everything else is because he's a kick returner. And the the big negative is, and we'll get to special teams, but with other guys kind of filling that role, other guys taking that job away from Kylan, that may plummet his value. The injury, losing kick return, and again, not being very productive when you were on the field last year, and Patrick Taylor being better, and Tyler Goodson and B.J. Baylor kind of showing up and, and being able to show, Kylan may just be out the door, which sucks for him because he's not there to defend himself. He's not there to get the special teams reps and to prove that he is the guy and to do all those things. But but the, again, this is all theoretical. We'll see if and when he comes back and what they decide to do with him and, and given those opportunities. But it's just a bad spot for him because there are some guys that are really gunning for all these different jobs and they're doing a good job of it. So at some point, somebody's going to separate. But right now, I just have the rest as tier two. Um, defensive interior, I kind of contemplated doing this similar to how I do tight end, but I decided against it because it, it it really just complicated things more needlessly than it needed to be. So tier one is Kenny Clark by himself. Um, he is the number one alpha of the of the unit. There's really no debate about that. Tier two, I have Lowry and Reed. It wouldn't be my preference necessarily, but the Packers clearly see these guys as the the top two guys. Lowry has been fantastic. I've, I'm, I'm a big fan of Lowry. My, my issue is more to do with Reed, but they brought him in because they like him. They think he's going to fill an important role, and there's no question he is sort of on that tier. The next tier, I have TJ Slayton by himself in tier three. Um, you could argue a couple different things. You you could put TJ Slayton on par with Lowry and Reed, but I don't think he's quite there. He has gotten several starter reps, but not nearly as much, and I don't think he's, he's on that level. So I do have him a, a, a tier down, and the one change on this entire tier is Devontae Wyatt, who I used to have on tier three with Slayton. And as I wrote here in the article, I think it was mostly just 
denial on my part to accept that Wyatt is is not with TJ Slayton. Um, TJ Slayton has had reps with the starters, with the number ones, and Wyatt has not. So I put Wyatt and Jack Heflin on tier four. Um, as I wrote here, I could have put Wyatt on his own tier ahead of Jack Heflin, but I don't have any reason to. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to put them on the same tier again until we see somebody separate. Now, Wyatt has been impressive in camp. So that does give him an edge over Heflin, whose name I have not heard once. However, Heflin has played. He has had snaps, snaps on the team. He does have experience. So I, I've, for now, I'm going to leave them on the same tier, and then I'll allow one of them to, to start to separate. And, and again, the good news is, I think, not yesterday, but two days ago, the first time they actually had like actual reps or whatever, Wyatt was starting to separate. He was starting to show that he can do some stuff. You're starting to see some really good notes. So I'm hoping they start upping his opportunities a little bit. But again, it's weird with defensive tackle because you can have some really great reps, but it doesn't matter. It feels like, especially at defensive tackle and edge, the individual stats don't matter. The question is, do you understand your assignments? They're very big sticklers. And I'm sure that's true with every position, but it just seems to really stand out because you'll get some guys that have some great statistics and great reps, and they just will not get any love because they're just not understanding conceptually what their job is on a play-to-play, down-to-down basis. And until you get that, until you know every single thing you're supposed to be doing, making the right reads, right adjustments, right everything, it doesn't matter if you get three sacks in practice, you're going to stay down because you're not getting it. So we'll know when Wyatt is starting to get it because you're going to start to see him move up, and he'll move up quickly. Because with his athleticism and his ability, if he starts to get it, he'll be, he'll be up there with Lowry and Reed in no time. But right now he's not getting it, which is fine because it just started. And then after that tier five, I just put Ford Byers and Slayton, different Slayton, S L A Y T O N, on um, on a tier together. I haven't seen anything from any of them in terms of their ability. I think Byers was just taken off of uh, NFI or Pup or whatever he was on, but um, otherwise, there's not been a single note about any of them. So they're all just kind of sitting there by themselves. Edge, um, there was a big shift earlier, but nothing as of yesterday that changed anything. Rashawn is number one. Preston is number two. Then tier three is Hamilton and Galea, um, which I, I, you could almost put Hamilton in tier three by himself because there's been a lot of positive stuff about him, about a lot about him being like really underrated, really talented, and I think they're starting to use him on special teams more. So I'm I'm tempted to put him in tier three by himself and then uh, put Tippa on tier four. But right now this is the number two edge rush group. After that I put uh, an Agbar and Garvin on tier four. No real reason other than an Agbar was drafted, so I want to give him some level of respect. Garvin has played a lot. It's probably true that you could probably put Tier 4 as Garvin by himself. Tier 5 would be an Agbar, and then 5 would be Manic and Jones, who are um, new guys that have not done anything that have were not drafted. You know, it, it, just kind of on a, a separate lower tier by themselves. Either way, it doesn't change a ton. Maybe that'll separate. That's one of the things I've got circled to keep an eye on is an Agbar Garvin tier four. Should they be on the same tier? Should they be separate? I don't know. But um, for now, that does seem pretty set in stone, at least the top three tiers. Rashawn, then Preston. And again, you could say then Hamilton, then then Tippa if you wanted to. Either way. Um, linebacker was actually a pretty big shakeup thanks to special teams. Campbell and Walker are number one. I still have Chris Barnes as the number two. I think the Packers like him more than anybody else. But What, as of before yesterday, it was McDuffie and Ty Summers were on the same tier together. Just because I know they're similar players and, you know, it doesn't really matter, but I don't think either of them are going to do much, but, you know, whatever. However, I decided to move Ty Summers down because McDuffie was used on special teams and Ty Summers was not, so I bumped him down. However, the biggest jump, Wilborn, was on Tier 5 with Ellis Brooks. So it was... Tier 1, Campbell and Walker. Tier 2, Chris Barnes. Tier 3 was McDuffie and Summers. And then I guess Tier 4, there wasn't a Tier 5. Tier 4 was Wilborn and Brooks. But I actually jumped Wilborn up two spots from 5 with Ellis Brooks above Ty Summers to Tier 3 with McDuffie. And um, the reason is he was the one of the only other guys that was running with the ones. When you look at the, the list of guys that ran with the ones, it's all starters. It was Campbell and Walker. It was this. It was that. But at linebacker, it was Campbell, Walker, and Wilborn, not even Chris Barnes. So there may be a world in which Wilborn is linebacker two right now. And maybe I should even put him on tier two with Chris Barnes, but I wanted to just kind of hold off because Chris Barnes has been that consistent number two. 
McDuffie, um, I think the Packers like to some extent, and he's got the special team stuff to work with. So kind of got Wilborn and McDuffie sitting on three, but you want to look at the guy with the, the arrow pointed up the fastest? Keep an eye on Ray Wilborn. He was, by the way, a uh, 2020 undrafted free agent. So he's still a young guy that that has a, a, a plenty of room to grow, 6'4", 224. Um, last year with the Packers in the preseason, he actually graded out quite well. He had two good games, one average game. Um, his coverage grade was an 80.2, which obviously is incredibly valuable. Really, really solid in coverage. Five targets, three receptions for 21 yards. Uh, week two, he was one target, one reception for negative one yard. Week one was one target, zero receptions. But then even on special teams, which maybe is, is part of it also, uh, in three games that he played, he had a 68.6 overall grade, which doesn't sound super impressive. But um, with limited opportunities, he did end up making a tackle week one against Houston. He had a 70 overall grade in that. So um, he's shown, and, and again, this was his first year as an undrafted free agent with the Packers last year. So this year is year two. And um, again, the fact that he's running with the ones Maybe it was just a, a weird shakeup or whatever. It might not have meant much, but it was it was very surprising to see that. So again, right now, Campbell Walker, number one, Chris Barnes, number two, tier three, McDuffie and Wilborn, tier four, Ty Summers, tier five, Ellis Brooks. Um, at corner, there was a little bit of a shakeup. And, and again, I've got the regular boundary corner rankings and then the slot corner rankings. So Jair, number one, Eric Stokes, number two, Razul, number three. He's the number one slot guy, but I also put him as the number three um, boundary guy, because I think if Jair or Stokes goes out, Razul steps in immediately. And then you, then you go to your number two slot guy to fill in that role, I think is how that would work. Um, tier four is Shamar Jean Charles, just because we've seen that is the next guy to step up. And then tier five, I just put the rest because I haven't seen anything to really separate them out. But Ento, Vaughn, and Thomas, I have in tier five. The change I had was in the slot. Uh, Razul Douglas is number one. I had it then Keyshawn Nixon, who is out injured right now, so he can't defend himself, but it is what it is. And then I had tier three was Rico Gafford. However, Rico is suddenly the number one return man. Now, it may be just to try it out or whatever, but the fact that he's ahead of everybody else and there was a bunch of other, I mean, including Amari. Amari got reps as the number two guy, which is surprising because you would think you'd start with Amari and then you'd try out some other people. Even if you're pretty sure you don't want Amari to be the guy, you still give him first crack and then let other people take the job. Rico got first snap day one or however many days they've done it. He, he's the guy right now. And strangely, I don't think he's ever been on kick or punt return um, as a returner. He's been on special teams, but as a returner, he has not done that at all in, um, I don't think the preseason or the regular season in the NFL ever. But the, the exciting thing about it and, and the reason why it's really fun to see what develops is his 40 time is a 4-2-2. So, it's one of those things where even if he's bad, which most of these, that's the thing, most of these guys are bad. Amari was bad. And so a lot of times what these bad guys will do is they'll catch it, they'll run in a straight line, they'll get tackled short of where you want them to get. You know, if you, if, you, if they kick it to the one yard line, you're just saying, please get to the 25 if you can't do anything special. Well, his ability to run quickly to the 25, if, if that's all you can do, I'll take it. And the thing is, if you can make one guy miss, it's, it could be some pretty electric. And, you know, you can say that play speed and, and 40 time are not the same thing, but if you're running 4-2-2, even if you don't exactly run 4-2-2 on the field, you are blazing fast. So it'll be exciting to kind of see, and I, I hope he can hold on to that job. 5'10", 184, he's a small guy, but he's small, he's shifty, he's, he's well, I shouldn't say shifty, but he's, he's built that way, and then just that straight line speed, especially on kickoffs, that's the thing, straight line speed is, is important. So anyways, for that reason, I put him above Keyshawn Nixon, because if you are going to be the kind of like Kylan, why was Kylan the number three? Probably because he was our kick returner. Um, so Rico has a real good opportunity to be that backup slot guy. I mean, if he's trash at it, then, then that won't necessarily materialize, maybe. But um, if you are going to be the kick returner, we have to have a spot for you. And so maybe that would be enough to put him over Keyshawn Nixon, which is what I think it is right now. So I moved Rico above Keyshawn Nixon. So it's Razul, then Rico, then Keyshawn Nixon. Again, Keyshawn is out, so he can't defend himself, but it is what it is. Um, safety, Amos number one, Savage number two. Then I have Scott and Davis. These two do seem to be the number one and two in terms of actually battling for that um, that number three safety spot so far. I know a lot of people have been excited about Leave It. Uh, the guy that we just brought in is a special teamer, and I get that. Um, maybe he'll get there, but as of right now, tier four is the special teamers, Carpenter and Leave It. In fact, it used to be tier four was Carpenter, Leave It, and Gaines, and his gains. Special teams yesterday, though, Carpenter and Leave It were 
all over special teams. They're making their mark on special teams. Ennis Gaines was not used on special teams. So he's right now the odd man out. Um, I have not heard him in the conversations about being sort of that number three guy. I have not seen him on special teams. And so he's kind of on his own. So I dropped him down to his own tier on tier five. Again, plenty of room to to move this stuff around in terms of, you know, if, if Leave It really can make his mark, not just on special teams, but start to push for that number three spot, then, you know, he, he could easily elevate himself above. Because that's the thing, Scott and Davis aren't really being used on special teams. The only thing that separates them is, is again, if you are that number three safety, that's, that's obviously most critical. We need a backup. But if Leave It can be the backup and he's a great special teamer, then he's, he's going to get moved by himself to that number three spot. Same with Carpenter, which I don't necessarily expect, but it's something to keep an eye on. So plenty of room to move this around. And obviously, if Innis starts getting used on special teams, he gets put back on the list with Carpenter and Leave It and all that. But that's how I have it right now. And then special teams, um, kicker tier one, I still have Mason Crosby, even though he's hurt. We'll see what happens with Gabe Burkick. But um, I'm not going to put Gabe above Mason just because Mason's hurt right now. I think it's Mason's job to lose. Punter is Pat O'Donnell. He's the only one. Long snapper, I put Jack Coco ahead of Steve Wortel because he got the first uh, team reps. So we'll see. Uh, and then kick return tier. I didn't have kick return. Or, actually, that's not true. I did. But it was kind of kick return and punt return I just kind of made up just based on last year and kind of what I thought. But um Punt return I'll do first because that is basically made up. I have Amari Rogers number one and Romeo Dobbs number two. Um, just based on what they did last year, it was Amari. Based on the fact that Romeo was a punt returner, I put him there. Kick return, I had Amari. Then I think it was uh, Christian Watson just because he was a kick return all that. It was, it was made up. But now I have a little bit more of a of a list that I can work with. So I have Rico Gafford number one. He wasn't even on the list as a kick returner before. He is now number one because that's what he got. Kick returner number two is Amari Rogers because he was the guy last year and he was getting second snap, second whatever. Then tier three, I just put everybody else that was on the list. Um, Kylan Hill I put on there because he was there last year, even though he's not doing it now. I'm still going to give him the benefit of the doubt that they're still going to want to maybe use him. Romeo Dobbs was used as a kick returner, so he's on the list. Hyman was used. Uh, Davis, I'm assuming they keep saying Davis, there's three Davises on this team, but I'm assuming it's the Danny Davis from Wisconsin that they're talking about was used as a kick returner. And maybe most surprisingly was Aaron Jones. And I wasn't exactly sure what to do with Jones. Should I put him higher on this list? Because obviously he's going to make the team. So maybe he could be more legitimate or should I put him lower on the list? Cause they're much less likely to actually use him as a kick returner if they don't have to, but I just put him on all on tier three, Hill, Dobbs, Hyman, Davis, and Jones, just cause I don't, I don't know who beyond that goes up or down. So that's how I have the entire team ranked. That's how I view them um, in terms of their, I guess, value to the team, what tier they're on. Uh, it's a good starting point if if you tend to agree or whatever, but it's, it's a good way to kind of set up uh, if you're doing a 53 to be able to view things this way. Um, I have not done that yet. I want to let these things continue to play out, but um, I, I, I've never done this before, but I really like it. And again, if, if you're interested in it, it's I'm going to make this particular article. It's called Packers Roster Update Day 3. It's free. You can go check it out. There's also a link on there to subscribe. I think you can subscribe and get a free week. So all the stuff that's on there, you can be able to check it out. But I'm planning on doing a bunch of other stuff with this, including, again, uh, Vikings and Lions updates, uh, Packers training camp report cards, kind of given all the different Twitter notes up to this point, 53-man roster uh, at some point. So be sure to check it out. I'm going to get out of here. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.